Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. That was very nice. <laughs> Can you all uh, hear me? OK, I, I've done my best, and I have uh, tried to be as creative as I could uh, with the title. I've tried to make it uh, as sexy as possible so that I can get uh, a very nice audience and open up this dialogue between uh, academics and practitioners or policy makers. And uh, I'm delighted to see that uh, this trick has worked. So we have a full room. Uh, in terms of uh, who I am, I'm a professor of strategy at Cardiff Business School. I'm also the head of marketing and strategy. I'm responsible for 32 uh, academic uh, members. I'm responsible for their professional development and their personal well-being, so I have a lot of roles. Um, as you can see, we have our own Twitter, we have our own, let's say, particular website. But before we start, let me talk about the agenda for today. I was asked to talk to you about uh, innovation and about new solutions, about innovation and about new product development in volatile markets. So there are three areas that I would like to cover. We have 40 minutes to discuss this, and I believe that the structure is at the end we will have the questions and answers. Uh, in terms of the sites that I have uh, looked, uh, I have spent a lot of time, when I'm saying a lot of time, five years during the summer, and I was visiting during those five years in the summer, I was visiting companies in Silicon Valley, in Boston, Portland, New York. Uh, these are leading companies in new product development and in innovation. And my task, uh, which is a task of being an academic or a researcher, was to identify things that they do differently from the rest of the crowd. So what I have done was to take leading companies in those states, and especially Silicon Valley or the San Francisco Bay Area, and see what they do differently. So what can we learn? What I've tried to do tonight, because I know that uh, all of you are highly educated, not to refer to any authors, not to refer to any methods, so just to the point. And I believe that this is something that we all like to see. So the companies that have looked, these are some of the examples. Astro Studio, Smart Design, Frog Design, Lunar, Continuum. These are all new product design consultancies in the US. They are designing a lot of the products that we are buying from HP, from Compaq, from Oral, so different kind of range. I will give you some examples. And then what we have done was uh, we went also to Unilever in order to see what happens in bigger companies. Because the ones that have looked are small and medium. So they range from 25 employees to 400 employees. Of course, Unilever is a different beast. And then we also looked at IBM in order to validate our findings. I'm a qualitative researcher, which means that I'm spending a lot of time in the field, which means I talk to people, which is very interesting because I love talking to people. So I talk to people, I observe people, I observe meetings, I observe what they do, I observe what they say, how they develop those products. And these are some of the things that they have developed. So there is a huge range from medical products to consumer goods that we use. All those are done by the companies that I have studied in the US. So these are very interesting sites. I would like to start with the first one, which is a Chinese cares, I'm afraid to say. May you live in interesting times. So when people didn't like you back in ancient China, they were saying, may you live in interesting times, which is a Chinese curse. I'm sorry to say this, but we live in interesting times. So there is a lot of volatility. If you look at the stock market, we can think about recessions that happened in 1999, 2002, 2008. Who knows? What do I mean by that? That this is coming and it's going, it's coming and it's going, which means that we have to prepare ourselves. This flux, this chaos, this turbulence that we see in the external environment will not stop. So what we have to do is to actually consider how we can adapt to this new reality and develop processes in place to actually cater to this new reality. Some examples to warm up. I have some examples like Blockbuster, Borders, and Polaroid. Have you seen these companies before? Are you aware of these companies? What is very interesting about these companies was at one point in their lives, they used to lead these particular markets. So when I'm talking about Polaroid, instant photography, or Borders, you know, books, CDs, video, DVDs, blockbuster, video rental. Do you ever wonder where are these companies right now? Mm, some of you are laughing. So you know where they are these companies right now. 
I'm afraid to say that they are not with us anymore. Okay. Or, if you look at Polaroid, it struggles. I was reading in the Wall Street Journal during the weekend about Kodak. Kodak was a superior company, high performance. And they are struggling, and they are selling the patents. So there are a lot of things which are changing that CEOs, executives, senior managers are not adapting to. And those things relate to the external environment. They don't get that things change. And when I'm saying this, blockbuster, you know, the video rental concept, which was great. I would have to go to the store, get the DVD, the video, or the video game, and then go back home. Very successful model. But then at one point, something changed. We had other companies offering exactly the same service, but online, through the internet. And what happens, the CEO or the executives of those companies have to realize that they have to do something about it. They have to adapt. And they don't. And we're going to explain why they don't. The same applies for borders. Amazon came into play. They, were sad. they started with books. Then they moved to DVDs. Then they moved to CDs. And borders was growing the company. And what were they doing? They were growing the company in terms of the physical stores, you know, retail stores around the US or around the globe. Again, we may say, but they couldn't see what was happening externally. They couldn't figure out that technology was disrupting their business model. And in retrospect, which is always easier rather than real time, they didn't. Okay. And actually, borders filed for bankruptcy. And actually, the internet, let's say, side of borders was bought by Barnes and Nobles. And of course, Polaroid, it's a company which is struggling with instant photography or focusing on instant photography. They didn't manage to realize that people wanted something more digital. And what is this more digital? They wanted to share the pictures. They wanted to show to the friends. Of course, the digital comes with a price. It's cheaper than the instant photography. I'm not talking about the quality, I'm talking about the price. So all those are examples of companies which were leading their respective industries at one point, and they started going down without realizing that the external environment, something is changing. And I have more examples in music. You have Spotify, Amazon MP3, iTunes. In video, you have more disruption. Again, iTunes, Amazon Video, again, Netflix. YouTube, love film. Do you want me to carry on? Yes, I will, sorry. Shopping, <laughs> eBay, we have eBay. What else do we have? Amazon.com, Google Shopping, City Car Club. All those are disruptors. What do they mean? It means that they disrupt the business model that we think is successful at one point. So we may think that we have the technology in place, we may think that we have consumers, we may think that we have a market out there, but in reality, all those things are changing. And what we have to do, which is why I love innovation, I love innovation, is that we have to adapt to the external environment, we have to listen to our customers, I'm going to show you some examples, and adapt the product offering. So, the pace of change is getting more intense, and I have some examples in terms of adoption of innovation, telephone 30, Two years, TV 22, radio 16, PC, you see less, internet 7. So what do you see here is that the pace of change, the volatility that I was talking earlier, it becomes more frequent. It's shorter. We're talking about product life cycles which are getting shorter. We're talking about globalization. We're not considering that we are part of this industry where the product life cycles are going to be shorter, and we will have competition by other parts of the world. Many pathologies. I like this because I said I'm a very field-based researcher, academic, so I enter companies. And what is very interesting about me entering companies for the first day is to hear them, how they talk about themselves. When I hear companies saying, we are the best, we are very beautiful, we have the latest technology, Nobody can do what we are doing. I get a bit worried. I get a bit worried. And you are going to ask me why. Because we have seen that size, age, and success are becoming obstacles. They don't help. If you look at size, you are growing as a company, so you have to develop structures. You have to delegate, you have to create teams. 
more difficult to manage, more difficult to monitor. With age, what you get is people know their ropes. They know what to do. There is an existing culture, and they are very unwilling to actually change that particular culture. And of course, with success, what do you have? You know, this arrogance I'm referring. They're very proud. And what happens when people become arrogant? They stop listening. And what happens when people stop listening? They start making their first mistakes, which makes this life quite interesting. So what we have is size and success leading to stability. I'm talking about inertia, pride, and arrogance. Blindness to change is technology. Failure to execute new strategy. Some people get it. Yes, we have to do this. We have to change. We have to go digital to go by those examples. But they cannot execute. Borders and Blockbuster. At one point, they would say, we have to go online. But they were very late. You know, the first mover's advantage, as we're saying. If you are the first there, then you're enjoying customers, your reputation. So you get more people. You lock in everybody else. So it's very difficult sometimes to execute the strategy. And the other thing that people underestimate is the scale of change. It's not easy. And I know that because I have worked with companies and I have seen change, it's not easy to change. It's not easy to tell them, yes, you were doing this through the retail stores. Now you have to do it online. Because it requires a new frame of reference. And people cannot easily adapt to new frames of references. I will give you some examples later tonight. Oh, this doesn't look good. OK. But I have some examples of companies which are long-lived. If you see at the, the year that they were founded, they were 100-year-old companies. And as you will see, some of them are operating in an industry which was very different from the original product that they started with. And I have some examples. Do you know this company, Goodrich Aerospace? No? Can you imagine what they were doing when they started? <coughs> Tires were very close there in the rubber, let's say. Same. I'll tell you. Nokia, mobile phones, right? 3M, office supplies. American Express, financial services. Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceutical. Vivendi? Media entertainment, OK. Marriott, hotels. Let's start with this, original product. Fire hoses. It's very interesting if you see how they started and what they do after 100 years. Nokia, does anybody know how they started? <laughs> Telegraph wires. It's interesting. OK. Office supplies, 3M. Does anybody know what the 3M stands for? Mining. mining, exactly. So they started with mining. American Express Financial Services. Do you know how they started their business? OK. Express delivery. Johnson & Johnson. I have great memory of Johnson & Johnson when I was a baby. I still remember this. <laughs> My mother was telling me about me, you know, not being able to cry. That's why she was giving this to me. Yes. So pharmaceutical, how they started? Bandages. OK, it makes more sense, more related. Vivendi, does anybody know how they started? OK, very interesting. Waste management. <laughs> this is what they were used to do. Hotels, in terms of Marriott, root beer. What is the point of showing you all this? The point is that. We have to adapt. And I have uh, particularly selected those because those companies, actually I created a very nice slide, but it's not nice in the screen. I apologize, but I've done my best. So this thing shows you that these companies are quite old, 100-year-old companies. And what does it tell you is that these companies, which are still in business or surviving, uh, they're quite few, first of all. Secondly, these are the ones which adapt to new realities. So we have to adapt. Adaptation is a very important trait to actually develop. So the second thing that I would like to discuss, the first point was uh, to make clear that innovation is very important. Yes, 
And I'm talking to people, I'm talking to CEOs, I'm talking to other academics, and everybody says, yes, we need to be innovative. Yes, we need to develop new products. Everybody gets it. Everybody gets the benefits of being innovative, or of innovation, or new product development. They say, if you don't innovate, you're going to die, and they're absolutely right. But managing innovation, or adapting to the external environment, is very, very difficult. That's why we're talking about this solution, which is called a bidextrous solution. I'm going to explain in a minute what I'm referring with this concept. Before I do so, there are two streams of innovation. The first stream is innovation, which actually refers to incremental improvements. So you had your first, let's say, iPod with the two gigabytes, then you get your second iPod with the four gigabytes. So they, the incremental innovations that you see are very minor. Not, knowledge is not becoming obsolete, so people are using previous knowledge. And there is a very interesting uh, thing about this, is that we need this, because this is about our current market. This is about today. Today I would like to have clients, and I would like to be profitable. So what I need to do is to give them what is important. And what is important is the four gigabyte, or the eight gigabyte, if we go back 10 years. But while I'm doing this, I have to think about the next cutting edge technology. So while Apple is developing the PCs, they are thinking about the iPhones and the iPads. So what they are doing is that they are working in two streams. The first one is about the today, the other one is about the tomorrow. And they are great because what they can do is to balance those two streams. Because these two streams require a very different management style. And this is what I'm interested in. That's why I've studied those companies. What happens is that people become defensive. What happens is that people choose. It's either or. It's like a, a box of uh, chocolate. You know, I cannot eat everything because I'm overweight. So I have to make a choice. So it's either this or this. And people become defensive. And people choose. But what happens if you choose this? It happens that you may lose a potential opportunity. You may miss a next wave because you focus so much on what is in front of you. You focus so much on your current customers. So you don't see what's happening in the other sides. And what I'm always saying about this is that you start, you are here, you are this company, and you are fantastic because you have this market share and you have this player here. And people who are sitting here in this company, they are very happy with themselves. Because what they see is somebody being small, and they say, okay, let's carry on, you know, drinking our pints, playing our golf during the weekend, we don't care about them. But this particular small player starts gaining momentum or market share. These people here still don't react. You know where they are going to react. <coughs> when they become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and they will start taking this thing. Then they are going to react, and they are going to say, oops, we missed something. This is something that we should have seen or thought. So if you focus so much on your current, let's say, products, your current markets, your current capabilities, you may miss of your opportunities which are happening at the edge of your particular industry. Exploratory innovation is also bad, because what you are always thinking is about the next cutting edge technology, the next cutting edge thing. And what you are missing is the today. And I will give you some example. In the dot-com bubble, in the 90s, 1999 to be more precise, we had uh, 10 companies selling pet food online. 10. Of course, there is no logic. What's the difference between those 10? Nothing. They're doing exactly the same thing. Everybody was thinking, yes, bad consumers in two years' time, in three years' time, they will like us to sell them these kinds of things. So everything is not about today, or it's not about tomorrow. The best thing to do is to actually balance those two, to be here, in the middle. Okay, This is the concept that we refer to as ambidextrous. Actually, we're using them metaphorically speaking because ambidextrous is somebody who can use both hands with equal dexterity. I can use my left and my right hand. The same applies for innovation. The exploitative innovation, incremental innovation, and exploratory innovation. So something that will be the future. 
And what is behind this is the concept of paradox. You know, what happens when we see things which are contradictory? Again, we choose. It's either or. What the paradox, let's say, concept suggests is that instead of being paralyzed or instead of choosing either or, what you have to do is to see how the one influences the other. Okay, how the profitability from your incremental innovative projects can fund riskier projects. How those riskier projects can fund knowledge back to the exploitative units. Okay, so we have to see the benefits of integrating both types of innovation. And I have this very interesting, let's say, symbol of uh, yin and yang to show you that these are part of exactly the same thing, of exactly the same side. Now, how can we achieve this? We're talking about managers who have to follow or have to grapple with a lot of different things. They have to focus on today, they have to focus on growing opportunities, and then they have to focus on future opportunities. So they have to focus on different stages of development in different products that they have, which makes their life extremely difficult. How can they do that? Different structures. So I have one unit, one department focusing on current product, current technology, let's say current market, and then I have another unit which focuses on other, let's say, markets, new technologies, new products. This is a very interesting concept, but it has some limitations. And what are the limitations or what are the problems? The problem is, is that it's up to the CEO's, let's say, responsibility to bring those two units together. They have to talk to each other. Because what we have to realize is that there is a lot of knowledge that should flow between those, let's say, units. The other concept that I'm very interested in, and I have uh, Janus, who is uh, an old god, Janusian thinking, which is about thinking those opposite things at the same time. Okay, and I will show you some examples later. For instance, uh, the companies that I have researched, uh, they give their employees some free time. So they say, take five hours or six hours per week and think about um, something which is related to what we do, but not related to our current markets or our current products. So in a way, they instill a belief that they can explore the future. They can imagine. They can create things. So this is what they do. So they can do both things at the same time. Of course, this is the first company. Uh, they, had, uh, they saw as an opportunity um, the internet. So this is a traditional LPD consultancy, new product development consultancy, uh, very prestigious, based in Silicon Valley, uh, quite old. It was established in the 60s uh, by two uh, German engineers and designers. Uh, what they were thinking in the 90s is that they have to move to the sphere of the internet. So instead of actually selling only services for new product development, that they could actually sell more stuff in terms of the digital environment. So this is what they have done. They had this one stream of revenues, which was coming from current, let's say, clients. But at the same time, they were thinking of tapping on an unexplored opportunity, which was clients related to the digital space. So what they have done was to acquire companies, was to develop a technology center in Israel, so that they can develop those technologies that if you go back in the 90s, they weren't there. So in a way, what they were doing, they were again working on parallel, two streams of technologies, two streams of revenues. And as you can see, the result was quite good. They managed to grow the company, to double the size of the company from 200 to 400, and double the revenues from 15 million to 40 million. Okay. So this helped them a lot. If they haven't done this, and if they stayed with their clients, maybe they could have done such a progress. So this is one example. So what do you have to do in order to create an ambidextrous, let's say, company? The first one is to create a both-end vision. Most of us are saying either or, either or, either or, and we're defensive. But what we actually need is a both-end vision. So we need to say, yes, it's about today, but most importantly, it's about tomorrow. So we need to spend some time, we need to allocate some resources in order to generate some new products for the new markets. The second thing is to diversify, so you play this, uh, I'm using an analogy of a portfolio manager. So you have a lot of 
shares. So you need to have some projects that are the bread and butter, as they're saying, they bring you the money. And at the same time, you need to have some exploratory projects which are riskier so that you can learn, so that you can expand your knowledge base. And then the other thing that you will need is to listen carefully to your customers, but at the same time, push boundaries. <coughs> a lot of us are listening to our customers, and we forget about pushing the boundaries or leading those fields. I have examples for those things. And the fourth one is about embracing temporal or spatial differentiation. People can think that they can do both, but in reality, they can't. So they need to allocate time and effort. One is about today, one is about tomorrow. And what I've seen is that they move around people. So one individual was working in one project, which was something that they have done in the past. And at the same time, this individual was rotated to something which was ex brand new to them. So created both and vision. I have uh, Jess Smith, the CEO of Lunar Design. Um, who said this very interesting quote, there are definitely a lot of tensions when you get different roles, embrace the paradox idea. The tension is just part of the process. You can see that in the language of that particular CEO, in the discourse, in the narrative, there are those kinds of things, tensions, paradoxes. What are those? Profitability, breakthrough, individuality, or the individual and the team. Okay, diversity. And cohesiveness. So there are those kinds of things. And these are the people who are aware of those tensions. And by talking to each other, or by talking as a team, they develop a both end vision. They say, okay, we have to do this, to do this, and this. Of course, they don't have the answers. That's why what they're encouraging, which is something that I'm going to say later when I'm talking about leadership, is a dialogue, communication. It's the senior management team plus employees. We have to delegate this responsibility to everybody. Diversify the portfolio. This is another interesting company, Smart Design. Maybe you haven't heard of them, but have you ever heard of the OXO household products? Okay, they are behind this. Okay, again, if you look at the consultancy, let's say business model, it's either paid for a fee or you either paid for your time or you're becoming part of the company. And this is what they did. They became part of OXO. And we know what happened with OXO, skyrocketed in terms of sales. So I can imagine that uh, the two founders of that particular company are extremely happy with what they have done. But this is another stream that I was talking about that requires more knowledge. It's different to sell design services and it's different to become a manufacturer a marketeer, as well as a designer, a financier, accessing the resources. So the point that I would like to raise is that you need to have a portfolio. Some of them are mundane, some of them are for today, but at the same time, think about your future. Then what you have to do is to listen carefully to your, let's say, customers, but at the same time, lead. And I have this very interesting example from Design Continuum, a new product design consultancy based in Boston. Uh, and I have a real example, uh, a particular, let's say, brand, I won't refer to the name, came to them, telling them that the new line is very popular with men. And this is what they have uh, heard in terms of the feedback that they were getting uh, from people visiting those stores. But this enthusiasm and this love for those speakers was not translated into sales. Are you with me? Which means, Listen carefully, but at the same time, push the boundaries. This company, Design Continuum, uh, set up a team. So they have created a team of uh, ethnographers, people who are observing people, marketeers, designers, and engineers. And they went into those stores in order to see what was happening. Why the enthusiasm of men were not translated into sales. And what they have identified was that the high-end market suffered from SAF. Have you heard about SAF before? S-A-F or WAF, W-A-F. Have you heard about this before? No. no. So WAF stands for Wife Acceptance Factor. <laughs> Which means, and this is something that they have observed, men love those speakers when they were visiting those stores because they were black, big, and loud. Women hated those speakers because they were 
black, big, and loud. And what happens when couples have disagreements in retail spaces? You don't have to answer to me. I think we all know what happens, what is happening. So if I was asking you, and I'm saying you, the gentleman in this audience, who makes the decisions in your household, especially the macho man will say, I do. But reality is very different. Women didn't like it. So what happened was that there was a fight. And when there is a fight, no sale is made. This is the very interesting fact. The other interesting thing was that um, this group followed people who actually bought those pickets into their houses. And they have identified that houses are another source of tension. Because men put those speakers into the most prominent locations in their living rooms so that they can show off those speakers to their relatives, friends, and families. And then women were going and were putting those speakers, as you can see, behind the furniture. <laughs> OK, to hide it, because they thought it was ugly. OK. So the company thought that if we have to talk to this particular market, what we have to do is to push the boundaries. Forget about what you know. Forget about listening. What we have to see is to see what the future is about. And they have designed this particular line, which was actually a best-selling product line for the firm for 14 years. So you can see that this design and listening to the customers and pushing the boundaries has really paid off. Of course, now there are other companies which are following this SAF or WAF you know, principle. So it's not about listening to the customers, but it's also about thinking and pushing the boundaries. Temporal and spatial separation. This is another company that I have studied in uh, San Francisco. A uh, very good uh, company, quite successful. They were behind the Xbox 360 in terms of design and some of the engineering. Um, the problem that they had was that they were getting old. When I'm saying old, 10 years old. In Silicon Valley, 10 years old, you're not the new kid on the block. You have problems. So what they had to do was to actually figure out the strategy to re-energize the interest you know, among the companies. So they have to reinvent themselves. The, this is the first thing. The second thing is that uh, these companies are dealing with the latest technology. So they see the latest technology or they see the latest trends. And sometimes they are inventing the latest technology. So the CEO of that company, Brett, said that, OK, we have to do something. And what we have to do is we have to, do, to raise money. So he raised 3.5 million. And he said, OK, whatever we think we can invent, we will raise this. We will invest in it. And we will develop a separate company, like a spin-off in the same, let's say, facilities. The interesting thing about this spin-off was that it was founded in 2006. It was a company that was focusing on video gaming accessories, like headphones or other stuff. And the interesting thing was that in three years or in four years, they have managed to grow the company to 9.6 million, which is the fantastic return of 9,178% in three years. Something that wasn't there before identifying this principle. The principle of not only thinking about, in their case, per fee or selling time, but of investing and in creating the products which requires a different knowledge. So for us who are thinking about those things, how can we create? It's something that we have discussed. It's both about both envision, is about temporal spatial separation. So at one point, I'm working for Astro Gaming. At the other point, I'm working for Astro Studios. Again, I'm doing this. So in different times, I'm working for different projects. The other thing which is very interesting to see how we can lead companies because it requires a very a interesting and challenging way of managing. So when we're talking about ambidextrous leadership, we're talking about identifying those tensions, we're talking about avoiding traps of anxiety defensiveness, and we're talking about communicating this vision of both ends. So it's about seeing the synergies of those contradictory demands. So let's take this, Unilever. This is the quote that we have from the CEO, Paul Roman, where when we interviewed him, he told us we look for friction points, many of which come naturally with size and complexity. And then he has a lot of questions. Am I in charge? Whom should I trust? So 
Are we talking about short-term profitability or long-term survival? So as you can see, it's somebody who proactively raises those questions. Because what we have to realize, and this is very important, People are very reactive. Yes, crisis happens externally. Of course, what we have to do is to react. But if you react, your competitors will react as well. <coughs> so what you have to do is you have to be proactive. And this is the point that Paul is making. My goal is to create an environment of positive energy, discussing those things. It's not about choosing either or short-term profitability or long-term survival, but it's about finding ways in order to address both. The other thing that we have is avoid traps of anxiety and defensiveness. This goes back to the point of frame of reference. All of us are very comfortable with the frames of reference that we have. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, there are some colleagues here, so they know me quite well. I usually wear a jacket and um, blue jeans or black jeans. I usually don't wear suits, but it's, this is for the occasion. But this is how people know me. If the following morning I appear to my department wearing makeup, a Russian red lipstick, a Roberto Cavalli sexy dress, and a high heel Louboutin shoes, I believe that my colleagues, yes. <laughs> I don't want to know who said that or who did that. Okay, I had to warn you. I wouldn't like you to visualize this. I just wanted you to stay with the words. Okay. The problem is that most of my colleagues would have been challenged because I was challenging the frame of reference. You know, they are used to seeing me something like this. And then the following morning, I'm appearing differently. A lot of people will do what you, exactly you did. You mean they will laugh. Some people will get intrigued. Ah, I would like to find more about Costas. And... <laughs> Don't get any ideas. <laughs> and some people, which is the most important fact, they will get paralyzed. They will be shocked. They will stand still, not knowing what is happening. I'm using this as a fun example. And of course, it is fun because it's about me, and you can visualize this, an ugly scene. But the interesting thing is that this happens even with companies and managers. The people at Polaroid, they were used in the, frame, the same frame of reference. And what was this same frame of reference? Instant photography. Digital photography came into play, and they paralyzed. They were shocked. They couldn't understand what was happening. They wanted to carry their lives with the same frame of reference. OK. A lot of us are doing those things. So Astro is saying that it's not about this. It's about trying new things, and it's more about confidence. We need to instill confidence into our people that they can do it, that they can think of new ways of exploring the future. So it's not about today. It's more about the tomorrow. And in the first meetings that I have observed while I was there, because I'm spending time there, I'm, I'm spending a month there, so you have a meeting, and then the president of the company has the agenda. And the agenda starts with new technologies. So these particular people in the organization work for this, and this is the project. Then they move on to current clients. So it's something which is embedded into the culture or the communication of that particular company. Very similarly, Brett from Astro said, per Darwin, evolution requires an environment conducive to the production of variety, as well as a disciplined filter. So the one fits to the other. So high-risk projects can feed knowledge. Mundane projects can fund riskier projects. So it shows you that there is something that we need to identify. What is very interesting is that instead of being paralyzed, what we have to do is to be energized, to be triggered, that the, re the reality that we are living has a lot of assumption. So what we have to do is to actually challenge our assumptions and discuss which are the assumptions that are real and which are the assumptions that we have to change. So I'm taking a very positive light in what we're discussing today, which is it's not about being paralyzed, but it's about being motivated to think of something differently. 
And I would like you, I would like to leave you in with this quote, which was uh, written by Scott Fitzgerald. He says, the test of first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. <coughs> and still retain the ability to function. What we see is that people grapple, people are challenged to do such a thing. They take positions, they take stances, this or this. A more energized solution is about seeing the synergies between those contradictory demands. Okay, let me stop you here. I think um, four minutes earlier than I should. Maybe it's more time to actually hear from you. And any questions that you may have, thank you very much for your time.